that's all right. Um, so, oh, yeah, I should probably see, say that we're recording the session as well. You probably all get a pop-up now. Um, so we can actually, if that's all right with you, then perhaps share it later on with others. Um, so yeah, really pleased uh, for uh, Benjamin Savakol to join us in this MSDI research seminar series. Um, so Ben was actually supposed to be traveling here for a couple of things and we discussed the idea of giving a seminar, but unfortunately the COVID crisis uh, messed these plans up a little bit. Uh, but uh, we thought it would be really worthwhile uh, to continue with the seminar anyway. And um, so real pleased to have been here. Uh, for those who don't know, Benjamin himself is a uh, professor of uh, energy policy at uh, SPRU, uh, Sussex University in the UK. And, uh, you know, he's a truly phenomenal researcher, I should say, and highly um, productive one. Uh, I think Google Scholar and ResearchGate and other platforms are uh, sending me messages almost every week with a new publication with your name on it. Uh, very productive. Uh, you've ordered multiple books uh, as well in your career. Uh, it's simply too much to cover in, in an introduction. But I, I think what I, I just want to highlight what I really appreciate uh, in Ben's work is your ability to actually do really good synthesis and articulate arguments across uh, various conceptual frameworks, theories, and also empirical fields. And I think that's an ability that not everyone has. So really good to 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 highlight that here. Um, of course, you you're well known for your uh, your questions, your social uh, science related questions, energy justice questions, ethics and politics in relation to energy transitions uh, topics. Uh, should probably also say that next to being a highly productive researcher, you also uh, well known for your editorial role at uh, uh, Energy Research and Social Science Journal. You're a lead author of the uh, upcoming IPCC 6 IPCC assessment report. Uh, you're an advisor to the European Commission. Uh, I think the list uh, goes on and simply too much to cover here. Um, so I guess uh, when I ask Ben to give a seminar, he actually sent me a list of, I don't know, perhaps 10 different topics you could cover. It was hard to, cho hard to choose from those. Uh, but what we decided would be interesting at this particular stage, actually a combination of two papers that have been co-authored over the past years. One is a piece that goes into um, reviewing, uh, I, I think about uh, a dozen um, different frameworks for actually understanding and conceptualizing energy transitions. Um, the second one is a piece that um, then goes into the temporality of energy transitions and a particular question around their acceleration. Um, and we decided it would be a good way of combining those two into today's talk. So uh, I think that's enough for me. We have about 45 minutes of Ben speaking, then we still have until about 6.15 our time uh, for Q&A. Um, over to you, Ben. Wow, thank you very much, Rob. What an introduction. I should have you introduce me everywhere. <laughs> uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And let me say, I've also been following Rob's work. So I consider Rob to be one of the best in the world. And I've been very impressed too with a lot of the smart homes work that's going on um, within Melbourne. And I see some other people on the call on the Zoom presentation who, whose work I really read as well. So it is a true chance to share, I hope, rather than just for me to give you a monologue about my insights. But yes, the only other thing I'll say is that Rob chose the topic today. So if you don't like it, you can blame him uh, and maybe maybe not me. <laughs> so I thought it would always be useful to start, you know, uh, Rob probably doesn't know this, but my original background is not in science and technology studies, but philosophy. Um, and if you go back and read Aristotle, which many of you probably haven't, he famously said that those who control the definition control the debate. And that often means that getting into the basic definitions and concepts of what an energy transition is can be very important at defining the parameters of how they're analyzed, as well as the kind of range of what's discussed. So I thought it would be good to start here. This is an academic presentation um, with kind of this, this really difficulty at the start of even just defining a term such as energy transition or transitions. And you can see here in the review article that Rob mentioned, you know, I've given you five different definitions. I think I could have given you 60 because most scholars, even scholars themselves, will modify and augment their definitions. But I think what's interesting is the kind of classic definition of an energy transition is simply a change in fuel sources. 
So SOS, security of supply, you switch from, let's say, wood to gas, oil to renewables, maybe nuclear replaces biomass. Um, and maybe 70% of the literature kind of uses this definition going back over the past few decades. But I, I really have trouble with that narrowness in defining an energy transition. I also think it can not only be in sources of energy supply or energy fuels or resources, but also changing the devices that use those resources to create energy services. Um, sometimes engineers call these prime movers because they're converting uh, energy fuels or units into services. But a very simpler term would be, these are the things that use energy, that put energy to work. Electric vehicles, cook stoves, televisions, mobile phones, combined cycle gas turbines, all the other things that can also change in terms of their performance and efficiency and their adoption. But even then, this kind of dichotomy of uh, changes in supply, changes in demand can ignore a third type of transitions, which are really about the economic institutional systems behind energy markets. Here in the UK, Rob knows this, uh, we famously launched about 30, 40 years ago, this whole approach to privatization, liberalization, and market restructuring, driven largely by the Thatcher administration. So here we can have not changes in technologies or end use devices, but changes in how energy is marketed, how it is regulated, whether it's rate of return, whether it's a monopoly system, whether it's a competitive system, whether you unbundle transmission, distribution, ownership assets, and all of that. Um, and a good example here of a massive shock in an economic system that had nothing to do with fuel or technology was the collapse of the Soviet Union in the 1990s and how it affected Cuba's energy system because they were very dependent on trade and aid from the Soviet Union. So there you had a massive transition that had nothing to do with technology and everything to do with markets and geopolitics. And finally, I learned this coming to Spru, you have a whole family of research that is, for lack of a better term, called diffusion. And this includes Rogers, diffusion of innovations theory, but also a whole host of other kind of models that talk about how kind of the change, the delta a T, uh, that it takes for a household to adopt something new. Um, and I think Frank Hales, who Rob and I both know, even surveyed seven different types of diffusion models from those that presume innovation spread like a disease, epidemiological models, to those that presume it spreads through information and transaction economics, to a whole host of other ways. And use the kind of diffusion curve is usually like an S. They can, you know, innovations can take off, can accelerate, can stabilize, can decline. There are early adopters and late adopters. So there's a whole class of research that, that also focuses not on the technologies, but on the kind of temporal diffusion dynamics. And complicating all of this, you can look at any of these things of a transition, fuel, demand, uh, markets, diffusion at any scale, at the scale of Rob's house, at the scale of your campus, at the scale of the city of Melbourne, at the scale of the country, at the scale of the region, at the scale of the globe. And in this review article, and today I kind of sidestep this debate and, and take the cheap way out, which is all of the above. To me, an energy transition really can refer to switches in any of these different elements on any aspect of energy technology, on the supply, on the demand, regulation, markets, and household kind of expectations and user patterns. Because of that complexity, as kind of Rob hinted, you can imagine there are lots and lots of different conceptual devices that attempt to explain transitions. Um, this is just one of them. This is from someone I enjoy reading, Arnoff Grubler and Charlie Wilson. They never named their theory. It would have been good to name it. Um, but they basically have a temporal and spatial approach that says that transitions from a new energy fuel or service to a, from, from an old one to a new one uh, go through different times. They start with experimentation, they go up to unit scaling, then industry scaling, then standardization, and then maybe market saturation. And they also talk about a spatial element about how these innovations, like Watt's steam engine, emerge in the core, which is England, move to the rim, which in that case would have been like the rest of Europe, and then maybe the periphery eventually, which would have been places like Eastern Europe, or even China, or the United States. Um, another one that I'm very familiar with, because I used it in my own PhD, many, many years ago, is Thomas Hughes, who had this notion of large technical systems, or LTS. Systems for him are a kind of seamless web of technological, economic, cultural, economic, political, behavioral elements that are fused together. Systems can create path dependence, which he terms momentum. And he also provocatively argued that these large technical systems, like electricity networks, undergo different phases. And in this article from two years ago, uh, Hughes famously stopped his phases at style. And this is largely because he was looking at the emergence of electricity networks in Europe 
and North America from 1880 to 1930. So it's 50 years, kind of the genesis of electricity, how it went from Thomas Edison's Pearl Street Station all the way to an intricate socio-technical system that had hundreds of millions of consumers in a matter of 50 years. And he ends his theorizing with style, which is that these systems will take on distinct cultural elements, more distributed models of cooperative, you know, maybe energy generation in Denmark, maybe more top-down modeling in Germany, maybe more kind of decentralized power to the states in America. And all that we did here is pick up Hughes's work and try to say, well, what happens after style? <laughs> and so we hypothesized that you can also then have systems that are reconfigured systems that can be contested, systems that can be destabilized, and even some like streetcars or French rail that can stagnate or even decline. And the multiple directions of the arrows are just meant to indicate it's not always a linear process. You can have systems that jump and go back into different equilibria and numbers of those phases. And it's not just related to energy either, right? We, in the article, talk about all of these kind of examples that cut across transport, electricity, telecoms, sewage, manufacturing, gas, even disaster response, like flood control after Hurricane Katrina um, or, or trolleys um, in Europe. So this kind of begs the question, those, those are two very, very different ways of looking at transitions, right? You've got Grubler and Wilson, you've got Hughes and those in STS. How many devices are there? And so what we did in this one, which is what Rob briefly mentioned earlier, is we kind of, we didn't know. So we, we asked the theorists themselves. Um, so we actually wrote to prominent people who were the architects of those theories. People, not Rob, I should have written to Rob. I wrote to Adrian Smith, <laughs> so, who's someone that Rob works with a lot. So I kind of captured Rob's thoughts there. But also people like Frank Hells, Johann Schott, Sheila Jasanoff, um, as well as people that are doing work on, on, on STS uh, works, like uh, Weeby Biker and Trevor Pinch. Um, and we, we talked, we ended up asking uh, 35 theorists. We invited more but not everyone said yes. So we spoke to 35 of these experts, people just like Rob, who really understand theory well. And if I was with you in Australia right now in person, this is where I would ask you the big question, and you could raise your hand. How many theories do you think these 35 experts gave us? And our question was really simple. It was, can you tell us the theories that are most useful at explaining socio-technical change or the introduction of new technologies or the social acceptance of new innovations. Um, and probably many of you would have raised your hand and guessed 20 or 30, or maybe you would have been clever and said 35. But in reality, we got 96 theories, Rob. It wasn't just a dozen. 35 people gave us 96 theories, not just dominated by things like behavioral science, which has a lot of models about decision-making, or STS, which has things like actor network theory and Scott and LTS, um, but a whole host of other disciplines ranging from political ecology to development studies, to ethics, to legal studies, marketing and mathematics. Um, and what we give you in the paper, which I won't bother to go through because it would take the rest of the seminar, is we literally list all of the 96 theories in order of their discipline. So behavioral science comes first just because it starts with a B. <laughs> and here you can see the name of the theory. Got to give Paul Stern some credit for a clever theory, the ABC theory, um, as well as how it applies to this notion of socio-technical diffusion, social acceptance. And that's the long list of 96 theories, but that list doesn't really tell you how prominent those approaches are. And so we also give you the short list. And here, this is a very arbitrary it had to be mentioned 10% of the time in the interviews. It seems like a healthy number. We didn't want an article that just talked about four theories. We also didn't want an article that had to get into all 96. Um, so this kind of gives you a sense for two years ago, what prominent theorists consider to be the best approaches that exist today. And the number one socio-technical transitions refers to the MLP, the multi-level perspective on transitions. You have social practice theory, discourse theory, domestication theory, LTS, Scott, imaginaries, ANT, justice, which isn't necessarily a theory. We let our respondents self-define what a theory was. Uh, expectations, this is Van Lente's work and others, expectation studies, sociology of expectation and anticipation. Others talking about values, beliefs, and norms or lifestyles. And then my favorite one, which has a great term, you taught the universal theory of the acceptance and use of technology, which came up uh, in management studies and information science. It's a very quantifiable theory, like Asgen's theory of planned behavior, 
that tests the people's willingness to adopt a new innovation based on things like ease of use, price, hedonic values, et cetera. So obviously the Academy has no shortage of conceptual devices. If we had interviewed 70 people, maybe we would have gotten a thousand theories. And if we had interviewed a thousand people, maybe we would have gotten to 10,000 theories. So I'm not quite sure what this means. I'll come back to it later, but we have, we have a lot to say about transitions. But my own area of expertise is far less theoretical and far more empirical. So moving away from this minefield, quagmire, treasure chest, if you want to be more positive, of concepts, what are some of the empirical elements of, of transitions? And this is, you know, the, the kind of second paper that, that Rob mentioned. I'm going back. I know I already showed this from Grubler and Wilson, but I wanted to draw your attention to the right side of the graph where when they have looked at these transitions in Europe, and these are pretty innovative transitions, the phase in of coal, right, to replace animate power, muscle power, and, and kind of solid renewables was a huge transition. The benefits of coal were incredibly magnificent, right, compared to what you would do before. I think it was like the work of 100 slaves and like a single lump of coal. Um, and so, you know, even that transition, which had so many immediate benefits to users, still took, as you can see here, at least 96 years in Sweden, and as long as 160 years in its birthplace in England. And you also have the phase in of modern electricity, oil and gas. And again, even though these energy fuels had a lot of advantages over coal, uh, they also took half of a century to 70 years to occur. So this has convinced some, like Vaclav Smil, who is a geographer in Canada, to say energy transitions have and will continue to be inherently prolonged affairs where it is impossible to accelerate their progress. Not difficult, not challenging, impossible to accelerate. It's a fool's errand to even consider that we can make transitions at a global scale be rapid. And you can take SMIL's data. This is the same data from SMIL that's plotted two different ways, just so to help you kind of see the insights. The above one is a timeline going back from 1750 and then predicting a little bit into 2025. And the bottom one just takes the timeline and adds up the years because it's kind of hard to count if you're looking at something that's horizontal. And what you can see is that at the global scale, coal took 83 years to just reach 5% of total primary energy supply. And it took another you know, two or three decades before it actually achieved 25%. Oil still took 80 years to reach all of those things, and gas took about 91. Nuclear, despite the fact that we've had it for more than half a century since World War II, and the Adams for Peace program, and things like the Mesmer Plan in France, um, still isn't even close to the 25% share of global energy supply, and nor will it be, because we're talking energy rather than electricity. And even at electricity, nuclear has actually dropped to be more around 17 or 18% of total global primary uh, electricity supply. So you can see some reasoning why skill, SMIL is so skeptical about kind of new technologies like wind or solar, because the previous ones they're replacing took so darn long to actually be diffused around the world. And you have further evidence if you switch the unit of analysis a bit to go into diffusion. So this is more now the kind of families of, of diffusion models and talking about the adoption of new technologies. Grublu and Wilson have done a phenomenal job here mapping the length of formative phases and diffusion phases. So formative phases would be kind of basic research, applied research, piloting, testing, pre-commercialization. And the diffusion stuff here is all about after you've, you've kind of developed the technology, how long does it take to breach market saturation? This is about marketing, advertising, uptake, policy. So unfortunately for us, to get the kind of holistic diffusion curve, you have to add them together. <laughs> you can already see for a lot of these innovations, it's again, it's hundreds of years. Steamships, fluid catalytic cracking, you know, even e-bikes and wind power have taken more than a hundred years. Um, and only in a few cases, like with e-bikes or compact fluorescent light bulbs, do you have very fast diffusion speeds. And it gets even worse, according to Grubler and Wilson, because we're just talking about single isolated technological artifacts. We're talking about single pieces of a technology rather than systems, right? It's much easier to transition in a new gas 
uh, combined cycle turbine than it is to change a fleet of power plants. And so what Wilson and Grubler were arguing is when you get to systems of systems, transitions at that kind of socio-technical system scale, it's even magnitudes of order more difficult and will take even more time and resources. And this is also apparent in some of the work that Bruno and Frank have been doing on the flip side of transitions. So this is kind of not phasing in, but how long it takes to phase out. How long does it take for a technology that you don't want to die off, <laughs> for lack of a better term? And I like this graph. This is from their study of coal in the UK, where it just also shows, like, despite the fact that we had industry pressure and shocks to coal in the world wars, and the fact that the 1950s London Smog and Clean Air Act dramatically changed the market conditions against coal. It still took another 60 years after that for coal to be destabilized. And the process of phasing out coal, as you can see, also has a lot of punctuated equilibria, lots of fits and starts. It's not a very linear process. It's going up and down based on a whole range of endogenous and exogenous factors. In this literature, however, there are a few oddities that it is worth noting. First one is it's very arbitrary at what point you say a big transition has occurred. Grubler and Wilson, I think, say, you know, 5% or 10%. Smill says 25%. Others say 50%. These are all nice even numbers, which also makes it suspicious. Why isn't it 4.61535%? So I think there is a bit of kind of, you know, back to Aristotle, uh, how you define at what a, a percentage of transition occurs uh, is very arbitrary. Even all of the work except for systems of systems traits the coevolution of technology as focusing on an individual unit. Um, and so what you may miss are A, technologies that cannibalize each other or imitate each other or compete with each other. So a good example here would be in the early 1900s, electric vehicles competing with internal combustion engines. Those innovations stole a lot from each other. The internal combustion car took pneumatic tires, larger boot spaces, electrical motors, batteries, and a few other innovations, crank starters, and applied them to conventional cars. So is it really fair to say that the old school EV died and the internal car, combustion car, won, when in fact they cross-innovated? They mimicked. And you can also see here that some innovations get coupled together. The two examples that I like here, railways and telegraphs, as you were laying rail, you had a lot of labor, wood, and materials, and you also wanted a good communication network, so you also lay telegraphs side by side. Same with roads and oil, a less direct relationship, but as you increase the ability of roads, you created better economies of scale for crude oil, which in then in turn created demand for more roads. So those two innovations were also coupled. So maybe there's a problem with only looking at one technology, an e-bike, one innovation, a power plant rather than the kind of interconnection among different systems and how they can co-evolve. And then finally, there is always this question about the unit of analysis. When you go back to that data from Smill, you see it took you know, 80 years for oil to reach 25% of total primary energy supply. It looks slow, but if you break that big grand transition into smaller transitions, you'll see incredibly rapid diffusion of things like internal combustion engines, steam engines on ships, oil lamps, oil heating boilers, furnaces, and a variety of other innovations. So that unit of analysis changes how fast the transition seems to be occurring. The other side of this debate, and the one that we tried to provoke uh, in, in the review article that Rob mentioned was, well, can we find evidence at least of transitions that happen much faster than Grubler or Smill or others anticipated? And we did, we cherry picked, so this is not a representative example. These would be called extreme cases or deviant cases where we chose the fastest ones we could find. But the evidence is at least promising. We've seen five of these very rapid transitions in terms of energy end use and devices that use energy and five examples as well at, at mostly the national scale or at subnational provinces like Ontario that are still pretty large. And what you can see below is these transitions are energy efficient lights in commercial buildings in Sweden, cook stoves in China, cook stoves in Indonesia, flex fuel vehicles, vehicles that can use ethanol or petrol in Brazil, air conditioning in the United States, and then the national ones are crude oil and electricity in Kuwait, gas, the Dutch ga dash for gas, the nuclear push in France, CHP in Denmark. We could have chosen wind, but the CHP transition was even faster, uh, and the phase out of coal in, in Ontario. 
And I realize you're all looking on this on Zoom, so you probably don't have a calculator. But if you were to add up, <laughs> oh, and by the way, all of these transitions happens in our lifetimes, right? So all of them within the last 50 or 40 years, and all of them reach 25% market share in at least 16 years or less, with some, like Brazil and Kuwait, taking one or two years. Talk about rapid. And if you want to argue they aren't actually affecting a lot of people, you're wrong as well, because if you actually add up the populations affected by the, those transitions, the total number is 940 million people. So in our lifetime, we have seen almost a billion people dramatically change how they use energy fuels or services in some meaningful way. Um, so that at least is one promising size uh, of the evidence about how maybe there are situations and contexts in which transitions can take off. And what's nice about this graph, as you can see, two of the most recent ones have also been the biggest, which are the cook stoves transitions in China and the cook stoves transitions in Indonesia. Uh, I should also say earlier this year, um, we did do some follow-up work. We had a grant funded by Horizon 2020 that was supposed to look at heat decarbonization. And we again looked for hot heat transitions. Um, and we wanted transitions that were both rapid and deep. And again, we found four other transitions that we could add on to the list that all took either you know, less than 35 years and they were deep. They affect another 310 million people. And they were uh, solar thermal in China, district heating in Denmark, again, heat pumps in Finland, and uh, the transition to gas central heating in the UK. So now we've got 14 examples rather than the original 10. We have others like my colleague Florian and Carolyn uh, who talk about how the kind of fundamental drivers of transitions are also shifting, like the drivers of transitions in a world of Grubler and Smill back in the 1700s or back in the 1900s are so radically different from an environment now that's dealing with the Paris Accords and COVID and globalization, that they really think that we were at a new era of where kind of historical transitions were by accident, <laughs> or maybe because of uh, the discovery of new resources, uh, they weren't planned for. Whereas now we have the fortuitous nature of being able to plan and actively govern transitions. We can design them based on experiments, based on policy, based on kind of trials and pilots. They talk about much like my systems coupling argument, they talk about how kind of the ecosystem innovation dynamics can proliferate in unforeseen ways. And so an example here would be the German feed-in tariff for solar power, stimulating Chinese manufacturing for solar in ways that even the Germans didn't predict and in ways that allowed solar's costs to improve far faster than anyone in the modeling community anticipated. And finally, I'm a little more skeptical of this, but, but, but Florian and Carolyn really have a lot of faith in the Paris Agreement, talking about how it demonstrates a real commitment to kind of move towards a low carbon economy. And I think at the moment, there are only a small handful of countries that have not ratified or stuck with their Kyoto agreements. I think it's like Syria and the United States. So they were really hoping that this is a kind of new norm, like slavery, where the international community seems mostly unified in their commitments. Florian also talks a little bit about new policy tools that have happened as well, where we don't necessarily have to always incentivize and phase in. We have a whole host of other ways of phasing out and changing market rules uh, and placing moratoriums on things like light bulbs or coal fire power plants. Denmark has a moratorium on coal or cars. Cities like London and Paris have talked about how they want no new cars uh, in the city centers by 2030 or 2035. And also, if you get really, really deep into some of the scenarios from the IEA, they do this really nice one in the Nordic region every five years. And this just kind of shows you quickly how rapid those transitions are expected to occur going into the future. So this is kind of a, there's an element of rapidity and fast switching of technologies in the IEA scenarios, which have not always been known for being generous when it comes to renewables. And here you can just see the kind of fast transition for electricity which will be fossil fuel free by 2050, the fast transition for heat, the fast transitions in buildings, fast transitions in transport as well. You also have people um, such as City. So I like this graph because it's you know, one of the few non-academic sources I'm drawing from. City is a bank, for those of you that don't know, it's not a typo. And City had a report back uh, in 2013 called Global Oil Demand Growth, The End Is Nigh. Nice catchy title. And what they were actually after is that we don't need to worry about peak oil supply. We need to worry about peak oil demand. So they were just kind of 
modeling the uptake of shale gas and natural gas on the U.S. economy. And what you can see is business as usual would have seen kind of a huge growth in oil production in terms of million barrels per day. But because of the penetration of gas, it's a flat line. And because of the right graph, you have this kind of proliferation of gas across all these different sectors, vehicles, trucks, chemicals, power generation, shipping. Um, that will mean we, we don't have a demand for oil anymore. Or to use the famous quote that I think some of you may have heard, the stone age didn't end for lack of stone. <laughs> so the oil age won't end for lack of oil. We'll have changing preferences and tastes uh, for energy services. Um, I also was really, really lucky to get invited to this interesting forum a few years ago. Uh, and I'm not surprised if you've never heard it. It needs a new name, Junk but it stands for Global Intelligent Utility Network Coalition. What's interesting is this is run by IBM. And while you've probably never heard by Junk, I'm pretty sure you, many of you recognize at least some of the companies that are involved, Eon, TEPCO, Fukushima, Tata Power, you know, CPFL, Centerpoint, STGE, Dong, although they're now named Orsted. Um, so they've, they've got a lot of really important electric utilities. And what was very revealing for me when I visited their forum uh, and these next few slides come from them, is the view that the incumbents have of the transition is that it's not academic at all. And in fact, it's already happening. So to them, and you got to appreciate this is, you know, electric utility speak. So rather than transition, it's a disruptive trend. <laughs> and look to rather than PV adoption, it's grid defection. You've got to love the terms. But basically, they're really already looking at multiple transitions in their markets that have them very worried at night. One of their uh, vice presidents actually said that he can't even sleep at night. He has nightmares. Many of us may have nightmares about sharks or something. He has nightmares about smart meters or EVs. Um, and, and these are basically creating huge transformations in electricity uh, that have them thinking that they may not even be able to sell electricity anymore. Uh, and so this came from one of the utilities, which I can't tell you which, where they're talking about how their business models may pivot to the point where they're no longer even selling energy. They're doing analytics like a company, they're doing lending like a bank, and maybe they're doing things like uh, installing um, fire alarms and security systems and integrating data. So it's pretty interesting that, that some of these longstanding utilities that are operating in Edison's day think that in 2050, they may not even be selling a single kilowatt hour. That is how seriously that they're taking the kind of transitions at hand and how much they may threaten incumbent business models. This was the last slide from Junk. As a sign for how fast things can change, they showed this nice graphic, which talks about the 67 apps. This is from Houston, Texas. So I think this must have been Center Point Energy slide uh, that can make a home smarter. Um, and many, many of these wouldn't have existed 15 years ago. I mean, heck, the World Wide Web has only been around since about 1996. So and someone in 1990 probably never would have been able to predict that we had this thing called a smartphone and it could have done all of these things here. And we were fascinated by this slide and we actually ran, won a new project to look at smart homes in Europe. So I just wanna kind of, this is another part of the presentation where if I was there in person, I would have asked you to kind of raise your hand again. So back in 2016, CenterPoint is telling us there are 67 different things that can make a home smart. If we were to redo their methodology in the UK, so European markets, in 2019, last year, how many devices do you think that we would have? And again, you could guess. And the answer is, after doing 30 interviews and doing 39, 37, 37 visits to different retail firms across a sample of different places in the UK, Bristol, London, Manchester, Brighton, Newcastle, we tracked 267 of these devices. So a huge increase from just a few years ago. And again, what you can see here is a handful deal with energy, lighting, gas, utilities, but so many more don't, like robotic vacuum cleaners or automated dog walkers or smart clothing. And I put this up here just to indicate how, I think the projections we've seen is that the smart homes market may reach $50 billion in 2020. So here is, a, is a, another transition in our lifetime, in the past 30 years, uh, that wouldn't have even been imagined, perhaps outside of science fiction novels, you know, back in the 90s, and it's here today and may grow even further. So again, maybe there is hope that we can have these unforeseen transitions into technology that can be very, very rapid, uh, but also very difficult to predict. 
I thought I'd put these next slides in here because um, I'm a huge fan of interdisciplinarity and I just wanted to kind of take a step back uh, from kind of the empirical stuff and the conceptual stuff to something more about methodology. Um, so forgive me for this kind of detour, but I think it's important to also think back about what these types of transitions mean for how we do research. And in my mind, they demand and require interdisciplinarity in at least four really important senses. The first one is that you may have seen some of this new literature emerge on policy mixes, kind of policy packages, where it, you don't need a carbon tax. You need like 12 policies at different points to help stimulate the adoption of new technologies. And one of the really neat frameworks I like has come from Felix Kreutzig, who's one of my IPCC colleagues. And they've called this the avoid, shift, improve framework. And what you get is you can see to create a low carbon society, you simultaneously have to have policies that are operating across mobility, transport, energy, buildings, food, and manufacturing. So the implication here, if you think a little bit, is, well, I don't really know much about food <laughs> or manufacturing. I know a little bit about transport. I know something about buildings. But it really does imply you need the transport people to collaborate with the buildings people, to collaborate with the industry people, to collaborate with the food people, who collaborate with the agriculture people and the aquaculture people and the food packaging people. So it really starts to kind of stitch together. The optimal policy mix demands interdisciplinary expertise that gets across all of the usual silos and sectors that exist in how we normally analyze policy. For instance, my own title is Professor of Energy Policy. It's not Professor of Low Carbon Policy. I think the second one is more about kind of demographics and gender. And so one of the most, one of the reasons the Chinese and Indonesian transitions were so quick is because they're helping diffuse cleaner cook stoves. And that's a very gendered issue uh, because it's mostly women and children actually. 80% of these deaths here from indoor air pollution befall women and children and actually that's children under the age of five. It's also quite striking is that there are more deaths here from indoor air pollution than AIDS, malaria, and tuberculosis. Um, so quite shocking. It's a huge epidemic that most people don't even know about. Yet the adoption of new improved cook stoves isn't just about changing sources of pollution. So it's not just kind of fuel science and engineering. It's also changing domiciles and domestic spaces. This would be kind of ergonomic research user design based research, architectural research. And then finally, it's about changing behavior. This is where we might come in as social scientists, behavioral science, sociology, anthropology, rural studies, gender studies, lifestyle studies. So again, if you're going to cha tackle this challenge of getting people to adopt a new stove, it demands also very different interdisciplinary expertise that gets out of the usual clusters of how we organize academic work. A uh, third example comes from Frank Hales, where he's talking here about his multi-level perspective, and we've graphed it in this short article for science. And what I just want to point out here is, um, again, he's kind of, he has a very complicated view of transitions that talks about niches and regimes that co-evolve and have kind of temporal windows. There are protected spaces and different phases. But what I like about it is it implies, if you want to understand the totality of the transition, look at what's on the left, business models, culture, discourses, technology, politics, economics. So here it implies we need experts who know a lot about each of those very different things if you're going to assemble a nice transdisciplinary team to unpack how a transition is occurring. And then finally, in my own work, I've been really fascinated by some of the ethical issues. So this is a nice little placeholder about the kind of the, the role of, of the humanities and philosophy and moral studies, where we've done in our very newest work, we've taken four European low carbon transitions, nuclear power in France, solar energy in Germany, battery electric vehicles in Norway, and smart meters for gas and electricity in Great Britain. And we've tracked the global injustices that can happen from those transitions across different temporal scales, manufacturing, use, disposal, waste, and geographic scales as well. I think we say micro, where the innovation is being used, MESO at the national level, where it's impacting policies and markets and jobs and regulations, and macro, where it may actually cascade well beyond Europe. And we actually think identified 50 countries here at risk for those transitions, including places like the Congo, where you have incredibly very high rates of poverty, and you literally have children, this is an 18-year-old minor, who is so poor, if you see, he doesn't even have shoes, those are flip-flops. He doesn't even have a ladder, he doesn't even have a shovel. So he is literally mining cobalt by hand in a dark mine, 
for seven days underground without structural support or safety at huge risk of things like mine collapses, silicosis, even getting the plague because you have animals in the mines that can bite you and you have to crawl out and possibly bleed to death. And this source of cobalt and copper and lithium from similar extractive activities is the backbone of our low carbon transition. So is it fair? Is it fair that you have a cleaner decarbonized Europe at the expense of a dirtier, riskier, riskier more harmful Congo? And I don't know if there's an easy answer to that question, but I certainly know it demands interdisciplinary attention that includes philosophy and ethics. Uh, and what's also true about those transitions that we found is they keep hurting the same people over and over again. They're not hurting the wealthy, they're hurting families, they're hurting indigenous communities, they're hurting uh, you know, low income families and communities. So what does this mean since I've now, I'm almost out of time. Um, I think first of all, it goes back to this notion about how you define a transition. I take a very broad definition, uh, right? That includes technologies, user preferences, demand, markets, diffusion rates. But whatever you define it, however it occurs, quickly or slowly, will depend on a lot of the assumptions and thresholds, units of analysis, whether you're taking into account coupling, co-evolution, scale, and all of that. So this is kind of just a cautionary tale of anytime you see transitions work, ask these questions if they're not apparent. Also, the Academy, largely due to the good work of Rob and Adrian Smith and others, has no shortage of conceptual tools grappling with transitions. But is this a good thing? First of all, does it imply that none of those 96 theories have strong resonance? So the fact that there have to be 96 of them means they're wrong, <laughs> right? None of them is complete. Or is it something to be celebrated? Does this just reflect the breadth of the Academy, right? If there are 100 different ways to see a painting, or a hundred different ways to appreciate a song, is it no surprise there are a hundred different ways to view a transition and what it might mean. And we should celebrate that diversity rather than view it as a minefield. My own take is a bit in the middle. I think all of them are useful, depending on your research question, depending on the puzzle you want to address, depending on what you want to reveal. But I think none of them by itself gets you a holistic picture about any given transition. So in that sense, they're all kind of uh, potentially effective, but also incomplete. The final point on this too is that if you did want to go by uh, the list of our interviewees about what is kind of hot or current or popular, it does seem like the two most preferred theories at the moment are the MLP and social practice theory. This is the work of people like Elizabeth Shove, Harriet Bulkley. Um, so I could see you reading this two ways. I could see you saying, well, these are the two that are deemed the best, so I should use them. Or I could see some of you saying, well, if those are the two that everyone are using, I don't want to use them. I want to use something else that's novel and new and different. So I kind of can see that both ways. But for lack of, a, of kind of either way of resolving that debate, it does really seem that those two frameworks at the moment are considered to have strong explanatory power and strong appeal within the transitions community. I think that point I just made about interdisciplinarity really matters as well. And this relates to all of us and how we build maybe grant proposals, as well as how we also maybe build authoring teams when the results from those proposals come back, right? Whether it is different approaches that cut across the usual sectors, transport, energy, housing, agriculture, forestry, right? Or expertise, fuel science, engineering, thermodynamics, exergy, architecture, gender studies, psychology, behavioral science, anthropology, sociology whether it's by the different dimensions of the MLP, experts on markets, experts on discourses, experts on power, by that I mean political power, not electricity, experts on demographics, experts on users, experts on innovation, or whether it is by you know, really stepping outside of our usual comfort zones to deal with ethics and morality and philosophy. I think if you go back to the 14 examples that we have, the 10 fast transitions and the four fast heat transitions, I didn't get into this, we do in the paper, uh, but the causes of the transitions are very complex. There's no single cause, um, right? You have World War II playing a very big role in the French and Kuwaiti transitions. You have a famine behind the Chinese transition. You have the OPEC oil crises behind the Danish and Brazilian transitions. The US air conditioning transition is a bit of an anomaly because it was kind of spontaneous by demand. Now, I don't want to read this and say that this means that we need more world wars, famines, and crises to accelerate transitions, but it does really indicate that a lot of the historical causes and drivers were really shocks, unanticipated events, or major crises. I do think, however, that the future need not be like the past, 
right? Feature transitions could, to use Florian and Carolyn's term, be designed in terms of active governance. We have a whole arsenal of new policy tools and mixes, including phase outs. Past transitions may have been driven by abundance, but future ones may be driven by scarcity. Past transitions may have been driven by security of supply issues, but future ones may be about changes in demand. So we really could see fundamentally different drivers that may accelerate transitions in ways that even Smill and Grubler and Wilson never anticipated. So I guess if I had to boil all of this down into a single concise statement, the past can definitely be instructive, but it does not have to be predictive. And with that, I'm happy to turn it over to you, Rob. Thank you for your attention. Thanks a lot, uh, Benjamin. That was truly fantastic. A great overview of uh, the various aspects of thinking through energy transitions, both theoretically, uh, empirically, um, and, and also looking into the future what is needed. I think that was, that was a great talk. Um, so let me, let me just open up the floor uh, for Q and A, and I, I would suggest to people we've got a, quite a big group of about 45 people uh, on the call, so please um, raise your hand digitally. Uh, you can find that if you click on the on the participants list button in Zoom, you can raise your hand there. Um, and so please let me know if you want to uh, ask a question or make a comment to the talk by Benjamin. And um, yep. Yeah. I've got a question from Darren. Darren, go ahead. Thank you. Thanks so much. Uh, let me just turn my video on so you can see me. Thanks so much, Benjamin. That was great. Um, I just wanted to ask you about positive deviance because that approach is used in a variety of different areas. And I wanted to know how you dealt with that specifically to get to those 14 faster transitions that you talked about. And can you maybe elaborate a bit further on how that approach could be um, explored in other ways to expand, you know, extend that kind of research. Uh, thank you. Good, good question. I, I'm going to, I'm going to admit, I actually don't know much about positive deviance <laughs> or negative deviance, either type of deviance. Um, I think it did come up in our list of behavioral science theories on that long list. Um, and what was interesting about the long list of theories is that behavioral science did dominate it as in because they have so many theories, especially people like Tom Dietz and Paul Seaster and Linda Stegg, who are like producing a new theory like every every year, it seems. Um, but I don't think we explored kind of deviance at all in any of the fast transitions that we looked at. For the first one, the 10 transitions, the there was no theoretical lens. We actually only talk about those transitions in like a paragraph. <laughs> So it's like a really concise, like mini narrative. Uh, and already the article was too long on top of that. For the heat transitions, we use the notion of polycentrism and governance. Uh, and this is largely because I, I'm quite fascinated by Eleanor Ostrom's work. Um, she was the Nobel laureate in economics before she passed away a few years ago. And when she's talking about how to govern transitions, she has this notion of polycentrism, which in an oversimplified way is kind of like mixing bottom up and top down together, multiple scales of action, multiple actors at the same time. Um, and so what we did is we used, she has these kind of conditions of polycentrism that we tested in those heat transitions, things like cooperation, things like positive externalities, things like uh, proportional equivalence in terms of costs and benefits, things like involving of users or organizational heterogeneity. You gotta love the terms these people use. So we didn't use a behavioral science approach that looked at deviance. We talked a little bit about norms and kind of changing cultural preferences. So for example, the Chinese heat transition was largely steered by a new norm that you should have all of your rooms heated in case visitors come over. So there's an example of like a non-technical factor that really shapes people's energy use. Also, you needed more reliable heating systems because they tended to open their windows in the winter, <laughs> which also means you have to reheat the house much quicker, right? So those, those are kind of two kind of cultural factors at play, although I wouldn't call them positive deviance. So um, yeah, it could be that we use positive deviance in another paper coming forward, but I, I admit I don't really know much about it. I, I guess I was just um, commenting on positive deviance. I've seen it used like in, um... Uh, in human-centered design circles, they sometimes point to that as a way to kind of look for solutions, um, you know, outside of the, the sort of typical um, um, pool of, of, of areas that people look for to try and find positive cases of people doing different things and see how that can be applied to 
develop you know um, similar approaches elsewhere in other domains. Well, I do know. So I didn't talk about it. We have a a project that finished two years ago called Hope. That's pretty 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 good name. Household preferences for energy. And um, in that project, we actually have an article. It's not out yet. It's it's under review. That did find something very similar to what you're talking about. When we interviewed households about what it would take to decarbonize their own footprints, many of them said it takes inspiring leaders and friends and neighbors, that when they see other social agents do that work, or especially a family member, usually a child, <laughs> who's getting their parents to do this. And I actually did this once. I won't do it again, but I actually got my parents LED light bulbs for one Christmas. <laughs> They weren't very appreciative. I think they wanted a DVD instead. But there is an example of me like trying to do the right thing for them and getting them more energy efficient light bulbs. But I remember a lot of these household interviewees talking about the power of others leading by example and how that could lead them to transform their own transitions. So I think that certainly fits into what you're saying about the role of peers and other social actors. Great, thanks. I, I got a couple of other questions coming up uh, now as well. So first up is Dominic. Hello, yes, sorry, I'll just put the video on. Okay, cool. Thank you so much. <laughs> that was fantastic. Um, I'm wondering about a lot of the time when transitions are spoken about, they're kind of spoken about in terms of being led by technology and you know there's that work which you mentioned about them being led by potentially governance and stuff like that but I was more wondering about the example of the in the US with um, the demand driven uptake of air conditioners and whether you think there could be the same thing happening in terms of energy with how communities are beginning to interact with energy and drive the narrative in their own regions. Yeah, great talk. A uh, great question. Um, yeah, I mean, the air conditioning example isn't exactly sustainable, right? <laughs> and, and in fact, it's led to not only a variety of negative impacts in terms of the cost of the air conditioning, but also negative impacts on the U.S. grid. The actual efficiency of the U.S. grid has gone down year by year rather than up predominantly because of the rise of air conditioning. I like community energy, but I'm also a bit more skeptical about it. So my own PhD was on distributed generation and small scale renewables in the US. And it was kind of this question of these technologies seem great. <laughs> they're smaller, more modular, easier to build, faster learning curves, no carbon or low carbon, right? You can own them and run them at communities. You can own them and run them at hospitals and universities and all that. Um, and they pay for themselves very quickly, especially in a world of blackouts, right? And carbon taxes. So the question I was asking is how come they're not used more? And then I went and spoke with a lot of um, policymakers, and I guess these were elite interviews. So I spoke with people like corporate executives, um, and used the barriers. It's like we we found like ninety barriers, you know, across these different categories. We used Hughes's notion of LTS. So we put barriers into technical categories, economic categories, political categories, and then kind of socio-cultural categories. Um, and yeah, it's like a lot of the barriers make sense. So one of the big ones was that most people don't want to become a utility. Most people don't care about energy. And you need at least a significant number of community members to go in for these types of projects. And unless you make it really, really simple, um, most of them won't do it. The other is that energy doesn't actually account for that much of an expenditure. Right? We spend millions potentially of dollars on our homes and tens of thousands of dollars on our cars. And then if you're in the US, tens of thousands of dollars on tuition for college, we spend hundreds of dollars on energy. So while it looks like a big market, in terms of household decision making, it's not that important. And in fact, energy is usually not even a decision. Anthropologists have called it a non-decision because you don't even decide, you just pay the bill at the end of the month, whatever the bill is. So I think it's kind of coming to grips with a lot of those areas, uh, getting people interested and excited that could allow community energy to scale up. So it's not just a bunch of isolated communities that have liberal values um, and liberal politics. And the final thing I'll add is we've just finished, as part of this heat work I mentioned, uh, a survey in five European countries. So we, we uh, national representative survey, we oversampled a bit because we had some money. So we looked at preferences for low carbon heat in Greece, Italy, Spain, Germany, and the UK. And one of our questions was about community energy. We asked respondents, you know, when you're thinking about heat, would you be interested in like 
storing it? <laughs> Would you be interested in <laughs> selling it? Would you be interested in peer-to-peer -peer trading? And the unanimous answer was almost no. <laughs> Those mm -hmm. households were not interested in it. And in fact, we also asked a question about trust. When you think about energy supply and information about energy, who do you trust? And this was really depressing. Social media came first. <laughs> Tech suppliers like Apple came second and heat, incumbent heat companies like Valiant came third. They came ahead of scientists. At the bottom of the list was family, neighbors, and friends. <laughs> so I, that's really strange. Maybe it's European, and maybe it's just a weird sample that we have, but there also seem to be real trust issues where people don't really trust their neighbors or their family members. And if that's the case, that doesn't bode well for community energy. Wow, thank you for that. <laughs> Thanks indeed. Uh, Meredith, you have a question as well? Yeah, hi Ben. Um, I'm interested in the what relationship you see between, um, I guess, exponentially increasing computing power, so Moore's law, if we just put it in that bucket, and energy transitions. And if there's something that is potentially really different that might be going on since the 50s as a result of that, and kind of just the relationship between those two things, I guess. Not something that I've looked at in depth. Uh, we have a whole program here called Digital Society. Uh, as part of another program called CREDS, uh, Center for Research Energy Demand Solutions. But my colleagues, Steve Sorrell and Tim Foxen have been looking at this. So the, the, that work is kind of split into three areas. One area is macroeconomic effects of digitization and ICTs on energy consumption. So that's the kind of big picture. We're looking at like 30 years of data, 57 countries to see, because ICT devices can help us save energy, but they also use a lot of energy, especially Bitcoin right? <laughs> and, and data servers. Um, uh, and there it's kind of a, it's a wash. <laughs> like it depends. It's, and that's really tragic because in some situations and circumstances, you see significant increases in carbon footprint and energy use. And in others, you see significant decreases. The second kind of stream of that work we're doing is on business models and organizational change. So this is more things like Uber and Lyft and Airbnb and the kind of dematerialization of the economy and how companies might make money on that. And the final one, the one that I'm doing is on smart users and homes. Um, and here I can speak just a little bit to kind of say, separate from maybe technical advances related to Moore's law, so advances in computing power and devices and technology, I think how people use those technologies is very complex. And kind of what came out of our work is if you can find, if we speak to homeowners, so we've, we've done expert interviews, we spoke to retailers, and then we have a, a survey, another survey, <laughs> another representative survey of the UK uh, with some open-ended questions at the end of the survey. So kind of like an interview where they could tell stories or give qualitative feedback, some of which was really funny. But um, what we get off from all of that is like as many ways that you can think of ICT saving energy in the home, there are equally ridiculous ways they waste energy. Right, whether it's people who are like heating their home extra warm for their pet who doesn't need it, or whether it is, um, you know, excessive heating for maybe understandable reasons like recovering from an illness or hosting your mother in law uh, or someone left a window open, you didn't realize it. So, this kind of or just conspicuous consumption, um, especially for some of the non energy ways that these digital devices, you know, like the robotic vacuum cleaner and the robotic dog walker and a whole host of other things. Um, and so I think we have evidence from this data that the energy savings are negligible and that in some ways, as much as smart tech can be a sign of sustainability, it can also be a sign of luxury and affluence and consumption. Um, and those types of homes, like one wealthy home could use smart tech to offset the energy savings that 50 other homes got from using smart tech. So there's also some interesting disparities that emerge that way. So I guess I would just say I'm, I'm skeptical at the moment of of digitization, but I think maybe we're at this critical point of, of it kind of depends. And one of our interviewees that we spoke with was really interesting. They talked about the need to write scripts into smart tech. So this would be like smart tech that is like, it stops working or turns off if you ask it to do stuff that wastes energy. <laughs> so it's, it's a bit, you know, it's, it interferes with freedom a bit. And they actually experimented with this in the US. There is a kind of famous US army experiment where they put uh, regulators on people's cars so the cars couldn't accelerate that fast. So like if you floored the accelerator, the car wouldn't move that fast. And the people got so frustrated with it 
the soldiers at risk of court martial just remove the devices because <laughs> darn it if they want to get somewhere in a battlefield they got to get somewhere so this also implies that you know when you start to restrict people's control and put scripts into the technology what will they do um, but I do think there's something intuitive there of how if we let everyone decide how to control and operate their smart tech there will be a huge potential waste of energy not necessarily much sustainability so maybe we need to start building in restraint scripts um, and ways that force the technology to be a bit more sustainable. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Meredith. Um, well, I give uh, some other people uh, some time to think of further questions. I got a question myself, and uh, I think it's about the connection between the first and the second part of your presentation. So I really like how you talked about the different conceptual models, uh, and and you mentioned that the MLP is one of the uh, next to the social practice series, sort of the hot models in town. Uh, now, I was wondering what, so these are basically theories, particularly MLP, which is most, I'm most familiar with, has been developed on the, page, on the base of past cases a lot, you know, historical case studies. And that's usually what social theory does, right? We study society and then uh, we do case studies and then we develop theory to explain what's going on. So essentially the theory develop is always behind actual social development, if you like. So given that we need to accelerate, given that we need to accelerate from towards, uh, you know, given the climate change and given the SDGs, et cetera, how, how can we social scientists become better in anticipating what sort of theory is needed in five or 10 years from now? And, and you could say the MLP uh, was a bit of a luck, you know, few people, uh, you know, proposed some concepts, put them together and uh, started that work about 10 years or 15 years ago. And that, that, that is hot right now because it now helps us understand and make sense of what is going on in terms of, of energy system transformations, for instance. So I guess my question really is how, how can we anticipate what would be the contours of the frameworks or the theories that are needed for the next 10 or 15 years of the transitions that we are in? Or do we even need new theories, Rob? Don't we have enough? But uh, it, it, it's a good question. And in the article, I mean, if I had gotten deep into the article, like the first half of the study, it's a really long article. The first half of the study let, mentions the 14 shortlisted theories. And, and even then that's a lot because we talk about what the theory is, where it came from, what its concepts are, what its benefits are, and what its weaknesses are. And we even have quotes, like we have people critiquing each other, you know, like Frank Heels is skeptical of social practice theory. So that's, <laughs> that's one of the weaknesses that we talk about. But in the other half of the paper, and this is where David Hess came in. David is another STS scholar who's a sociologist. We try to create these typologies of how these theories work. And we came up with two that I think are helpful. The first typology is where the theory focuses its kind of core arguments. Is it on agency? Is it on structure? Is it on meaning? That's the kind of classic triangle, the three eyes, like uh, individuals, institutions, and ideas. Or is it right in the middle? like a processual theory or a relational theory. And that's where both social practice theory and MLP situate themselves. They say they're, they appreciate the role of all three of those things. And maybe that's why they're so good and so hot because they're able to explain things that an, only an agent-based theory can or only a structure-based theory can. They're able to look between them. And then there's a fifth class of theories that gets outside the triangle that doesn't fit. The first four are all descriptive but the fifth type is evaluative, it's judgmental. It's things like justice or sustainable development where it will take a stance and say, nuclear power is bad because of the waste or solar home systems are good because of their gender relations and the way that they can meet the SDGs. And there's also some tension there, like people like Biker and Pinch will say in their work on Scott that you should never judge, you should always be neutral. <laughs> and there's even a debate in STS about captives of controversy and the role that we should play in controversies about principles of symmetry. Um, so I think, but I think that kind of works. And, and so I think there you've kind of got two very different things theories are doing. Are they seeking to describe or are they seeking to advocate, judge, and evaluate? And I think we'll need both types going forward. The second way that's very interesting is we then classify the theories based on their fundamental assumptions. And here you've got some theories are very deterministic and very positivist, like you taught. Like the STS people hate those theories just as much as I guess those theory architects don't like con constructivist theories. And we put the theories into four different categories of like interpretivism, constructivism, conflict, and all of that. And you can see also clusters of theories of where they map. And the kind of argument there is that it's probably possible to fertilize theories in transmission zones around those clusters. 
but not if you're too far away. So you couldn't take something like Utah, which is very positivist, and combine it with discourse analysis, which is very constructivist. It wouldn't work. So I think what that also means is, is feature theory building is about looking at the fundamental assumptions and aligned ontologies and epistemologies. And I was really hoping after all of this work that David and I were going to synthesize it into a master theory. That was the kind of goal. We would like find the 97th theory that did it all like Darwin for evolution. And instead, all we got was like a lot of caveats and conditions that we couldn't do it. And even quotes from respondents like Sheila Jasanoff, who said, what rubbish. You can't mix and match theories like fashion accessories. You need to pick the one and stick with it. So there's also this kind of tension about dogmas, dogmatism versus inclusivity. Um, and you have others like Andy Sterling who reply that people who are theoretical dogmatists are like the aristocrats who are trying to preserve their bloodlines and are committing incest <laughs> and are actually weakening theory because they refuse to acknowledge and fertilize it with other ideas. So I think those three domains, what are the fundamental assumptions of a theory? Is it processual, agent-based, structure-based, discourse-based, or normative? What are its underlying epistemologies, constructivist, interpretivist, et cetera? And should you be dogmatic in how you apply it or inclusive and theoretically promiscuous <laughs> in how you combine things together? I think those three questions will help answer what theories should be useful going forward. So I guess those are more overarching principles for theory building rather than any set list of theories I think we ought to invent. Uh, thanks, Ben. That's a great answer. It reminds me of, uh, I think it was Frank Hills or René Kemp who said that uh, social scientists uh, you know, would rather use someone else's toothbrush rather than someone else's theoretical framework. Uh, which, uh, <laughs> That's good. I need which, to use that. <laughs> probably true. <laughs> um, uh, Yolanda, you got a question. Or comment. Yeah, I do. Thanks. Thanks, Robin. Great talk, Benjamin. That was fantastic. Um, I, I just want to um, ask you to elaborate a bit more about what you think a holistic or an interdisciplinary approach would look like, because I'm sure, as you're well aware, often the criticism, particularly in the energy space, has been um, that the problems come sort of predefined from a, a more technical perspective and then the social sciences are sort of called in to help answer specific problems and um, haven't always been at the agenda setting table in terms of what the problems actually are and what a transition even is. So I guess there's that consideration, but I guess also as at a bigger level, I, I just sort of am still on the fence personally about whether a holistic approach is actually desirable and I guess it gets to those points you were just making before about you know pe certain people saying well a theory is you know you have to follow through with the one theory and so when you're starting to talk about seeing things from different perspectives um, does that mean a sort of combination of approaches in order to make up this consistent or somehow plausible and coherent whole or does it mean still maintaining some sort of um, truth to all the different parts and then, and then that becomes kind of a, an interesting question. How do you bring all these disparate and quite different perspectives together to create some sort of whole? So, uh, yeah, um, it's something I've been grappling with for a while. I just wanted to hear your thoughts on that. No, oh, it's a great, great question, Yolanda. So um, two, two reflections. The first is that in my own work, I find myself often justifying empirical novelty above conceptual novelty. And that is, I think, especially at journals like Research Policy, which Rob is familiar with, they often ask for, you've got to advance a theory. You've got to advance a theory. Where's your theoretical contribution? And even at SPRU, it's like we're always asking students to make theoretical contributions. And that is important, but it's not the only darn type. There is just as much value sometimes in empirical contribution. Talking to the survivors of Fukushima, doing interviews with new smart home adopters in Australia, right? Kind of hard to reach groups that can really give rich empirical data that let others use to build theory. Your value is kind of bringing that to the academy. So I, I just wanted to first say that I don't think that all of our work ought to always be focused on theory building. And in fact, I think we often obsess over theory in a narrow way that makes it really hard for practitioners and non-academics to even engage. Like we just had a really unfortunate experience at the journal of a bunch of practitioners who are running a living lab and have been running it for 10 years, submitted a really good article, and they got hit with three reviewers who were like, why don't you go read social practice theory? <laughs> and this practitioner's like, what is social practice theory? <laughs> I don't know what that is, you know? So it's like, how do we, is there a space for that type of research that just has nothing to do with theory, 
but it's very empirically mm -hmm. rich. And I think there is, but I know there are many others who, who don't. To your more question about kind of assembling theories, I, okay, I think there are kind of three ways that you can make something conceptually novel. The first way is the hardest, and it's something that I, not many people can do. It's you invent your new theory. So you're Elizabeth Shove and you invent social practice theory, or you're Frank Hales and Johann Schott and you invent the MLP, you know, along with others. Or you're Rob Raven and Adrian Smith talk about protected space, which is kind of a nice contribution um, to that debate. But most of us aren't that lucky. The second thing that you could do is if you synthesize stuff into a meta theory. So this is exactly what Utah did, which was in my, my presentation, where Utah took eight very well-known theories, including Roger's diffusion of innovations theory, Asgen's theory of planned behavior, Schwartz's norm activation model, and it put them into a single heuristic that can be used to test with variables uh, adoption and use of new technologies. But that's also hard to do. And in some ways, Frank did this with the MLP because it's kind of pieces of STS, evolutionary economics, history, and all that. So whether Frank's was a new theory or a synthesis of old theories kind of blurs that line. But again, both of those two strategies are very high risk. The third one, the one that I personally have come to really like, doesn't have you inventing, doesn't have you synthesizing. It just has you testing. So I've called this theoretical triangulation. Uh, it's where you take a given case study or phenomenon and you test it through the lens of multiple theories. And there's a classic example here in political science of Graham Allison did this in 1969 uh, with the Cuban Missile Crisis, where he looked at it through three dominant political science approaches, like constructivism, realism, and liberalism, and found that, wait a minute, each of those approaches explains it. <laughs> How does that work? How can three very different approaches all explain the same event in different ways? And we've had others that have started to do this too, where they'll take you know, the uptake of solar and they'll look at it through norm activation model, value belief model, and Rogers diffusion of innovations. And what I like there is, is you're just testing the fit of those theories. You're testing their analytical power. You're testing whether they're fit for purpose. Um, and I think that's it's a safer route and it's also more interesting. Um, and it helps you kind of show fits and misfits among theories that could help others synthesize. But I think it also just shows you that no theory by itself captures captures everything. Um, and as you do that, I think that, that what we tell our students when they choose theories, so this is also a critique, I think, about how a lot of us supervise students. So I need to make sure my dissertation supervisor is not listening. When I sat down to choose my theoretical framework for my PhD, my supervisor handed me his book. Use this one, <laughs> you know? That's not a very rigorous process. Shouldn't have we actually surveyed a bunch of theories and decided which ones maybe fit the best? And that's kind of what we did in the article with David where we surveyed 97 theories. And it's like, why aren't more of us doing that? Why aren't we considering other people's toothbrushes, so to speak? you know, to use Rob Raven's terminology. So there is a gentle critique with how we select theory. It's usually based on familiarity rather than necessarily the best fit or what could be the most fruitful. And this whole theoretical triangulation process, I think is a, is a good way of seeing which theories are fit for purpose, especially across very different disciplines. So it's a nice way of, if you want a, a gentler term, flirting with theory, teasing with theory, right? To kind of help show uh, strengths and shortcomings that aren't possible with one theory in isolation. Are you convinced, Yolanda? <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's giving me lots to think about. Thanks, Benjamin. <laughs> You're welcome. Yeah, thanks, Yolanda, and thanks, Benjamin, as well. I'm afraid we've come to the end of this uh, particular session. I, I, that was that was fantastic, Benjamin, and um, I, you need to know whenever you still decide to come back to Australia, in the future, please reach out again because I'm happy to actually host a real life seminar with you as well or find other ways of continuing this uh, particular discussion. I think it was it was extremely uh, well presented and, and a very good Q&A afterwards. So thanks, Ben. Um, Thank you very be much. Be in touch. And uh, thanks to all people participating in the dialogue. Take care, everybody. Thanks very much. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Benjamin. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs>